Our Old Testament reading comes from Isaiah chapter 35. This passage is the basis for our message today. The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom like the crocus. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, the majesty of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who have an anxious heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. For waters break forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool and the thirsty ground springs of water. In the haunt of jackals where they lie down, the grass shall become reeds and rushes and a highway shall be there. And it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it. It shall belong to those who walk on the way. Even if they are fools, they shall not go astray. No lion shall be there, nor any ravenous beast come up on it. They shall not be found there. But the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The text for today's message is Isaiah chapter 35 that Pastor Sam read for us just a few moments ago. Well, this morning, firstly, I would like to thank you for giving me some time off for that vacation time I spent in the woods taking a nap. So I just might then awaken to a forest that was teeming with birds and squirrels and deer. It was a wonderful experience. Thank you. Now, I suppose there are a wide variety of ways we all can just soak in nature. For some of us, it might be time at the beach, taking in that rhythm of the waves back and forth, the salt air, and of course, the sunshine that the Lord provides. But for others, it might be, you know, like me, who like that early morning silence of the woods before everything awakens and starts its day of gathering. These simple moments of sitting on the sand and taking in the warmth and the rhythm of the waves, it's refreshing, isn't it? And the simple moments of sitting in silence in the woods, watching squirrels and the like. We see that nature hasn't run totally amok. It's actually a moment that gives us a little more hope. Now, I suspect that these moments help us at least just for a little bit because the world around us seems to endlessly run toward destruction. But yet, those moments tell us it is still turning. Someone still is in control of all things. God has not abandoned us, and our hope is restored. And that hope is what brings us peace. It enables us to face what might be coming in the days ahead. Yet even in this rhythm of the waves and the warmth of the sun or hiking in the woods, the truth is we are surrounded by death. Seashells on the beach are shells of animals that once lived Oftentimes, seaweed is lying there decaying. The woods are littered with leaves that once were alive but now crunch underneath our feet 
along with the twigs and branches that used to be attached to a tree. Maybe that is why hope sometimes seems so temporary. Viktor Frankl, a Holocaust survivor in his book, Man's Search for Ultimate Meaning, notes that beyond a decision by the Nazis, hope was the determining factor for survival in the concentration camps. Hope was literally the food that kept people alive despite horrific circumstances. Last week, Pastor Arp expertly walked you through that text of Isaiah chapter 11 as he explained who Jesse was and why this shoot from the stump of Jesse brought the Israelites hope. And much like last week, the words of Isaiah in our text today constitute a biblical vision of the future that will help us cling to the hope that we have in our Savior as we walk along the highway that God has prepared for us. Now, how did Pastor R. put it? Biblical visions come to us from the future to shape our lives in the present. So today, through the prophet Isaiah, the Lord lays before us another future vision of things that are certain in an effort to fuel our hope and shape our life of faith in this present moment. Today, God gives us these things through the words of Isaiah. He gives us a vision of creation's promised restoration. He gives us promises of redemption and salvation and life eternal with Him. In a word... God gives us hope, a sure and certain hope, not some wishy-washy thing that is diluted by the death that surrounds us. It is something we can carry wherever we go. In fact, in God, hope abounds, even in the midst of devastation. This hope is food for our soul. God is literally providing us with a form of sustenance to aid us in our daily life. Now this vision of life in our lesson today is a striking contrast with the judgment and death in chapter 34. I urge you today to go back and read chapter 34 of Isaiah and then chapter 35 as we did today to see this contrast. Isaiah uses the stark contrast of a desert and a marsh. The desert is seemingly devoid of life and the marsh, well, it is teeming with life. And what is the response of the land itself? Well, Isaiah simply states, the tried land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice. Can you imagine the land rejoicing at Jesus' coming? I want to see that. Now, to describe this change to his contemporary hearers, Isaiah describes it in terms of Lebanon, Mount Carmel and Sharon. Lebanon is that next country north of the kingdom of Israel. It is known for its majestic cedar trees planted by God. And since it is outside of Israel, here Lebanon represents the work of God and not of man. Mount Carmel lies almost at the northern border of Israel near the Mediterranean Sea, and it was here that Elijah did battle with the prophets of Baal, and God saw to it that Elijah won. Mount Carmel represents the place where deceit and untruth are removed. And Sharon, well, it is that fertile plain that stretches from Mount Carmel south along the coast of Israel. It is known for lush vegetation and a great place to grow crops that sustain life. 
These word pictures describe a new heaven, a new earth as majestic like a mountain and fertile like the valley. The new heaven and new earth to come will be breathtaking. As the most desolate places on the earth will be transformed into the most glorious. As I read this today, I was reminded that the region of Pennsylvania where my father grew up had towns and cities named Lebanon and Mount Carmel and Sharon. It would seem that our forefathers chose biblical names for towns to perpetuate this proclamation every day of God's promises to hold out His hope before us. I thank God for the foresight of our forefathers. But wait, there's even more here. For Isaiah tells us that we will see God's glory. I wonder what that'll be like. I know you wonder as well because we all yearn for those moments in our life where we see God's glory. It's one of the reasons why we go to the beach or to the mountains. We strain to see His glory. But Isaiah writes, we shall see the glory of the Lord and the majesty of our God. Now just pause for a moment. The glory of our Lord, that has to be overwhelming. The majesty of our God, just what is Isaiah saying? Well, it's more than we might think. For Isaiah's reference here to the glory of the Lord tells us that when God's glory appears, God is at work to save His people. For the hearers of Isaiah's words, at the very first, they remember the glory of the Lord appeared in a pillar of smoke and fire that led the Israelites to safety in the wilderness. The glory of the Lord parted the Red Sea. They were witness to God's glory and His work to save and sustain His people. And in today's vision, His glory culminates in this promise. He will come to save you. The one who is coming is Christ the Lord. It's the one who's coming we celebrate this Advent season. And I would imagine that Israel, the nation who has seen God's glory before them, would be dumbfounded to hear that our Savior came as a little baby, born of lowly Mary. Certainly hiding His glory, but allowing it to peek through in the angelic announcement to the shepherds and to that star that guided the wise men to our Lord. We will sing about that angelic announcement a little later in this service. And what is the result of His coming? Well, it's His saving. Isaiah describes it this way, Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf unstopped, then the lame man shall leap like a deer. Have you ever seen a deer leap? That will be amazing. And the tongue of the mute sing for joy. For waters break forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool. And the thirsty ground springs of water. The haunt of jackals where they lie down, the grass shall become reeds and rushes. Certainly reeds and rushes are not places where jackals want to be. They will be displaced. Did 
you notice that this is the passage that Jesus quoted to the disciples of John the Baptist in our gospel lesson today? The Savior of which Isaiah writes is now here. But wait, there's more. We all know that there is a vision of a highway, and we know that highways are one of those things that we build for a specific purpose of moving as many people as possible, as quickly as possible, from one place to another, as safely as possible. Yet highways for us can also be a place of danger. Whether it be changing weather, traffic congestion, or poor drivers, all these things bring their own type of danger, making the highway a place where we cannot drop our guard. But in contrast, the highway presented here is the way of holiness. It's more than a well-trod path. It is a safe and prepared road set aside for the redeemed. And now through the words of Isaiah, God promises that there will be no danger on this highway. And once on this road, nothing will keep you from reaching your final destination, which is Zion, to dwell with God himself forever. It is a safe direct and prepared path for us to follow so that we too might come to the Father. <sighs> Yet, we are stubborn. You know, my time in the Navy provided me with this saying, there's the right way, there's the wrong way, and there is the Navy way which was a nice short way of saying, I know you think you have a better idea, but while you're in the Navy, you're doing it the Navy way. Now, I know that actually resonates with many of us, for many of us have heard from our parents this dreadful phrase, it's my way or the highway. Now, if you ever heard that sentence uttered, you know that that was the end of the discussion or argument. When you heard it, it was over and it was time to act according to your parents' wishes. And if you didn't like it, the ultimatum was the front door is right there. Feel free to choose it and leave. But if you exercise that choice, you will be left to fend for yourself in all things. Whew, that is weighty. Now, the sentiment here in today's lesson is just as true, but it is so much different. For the contrast here is this. The Father is not saying my way or the highway. But rather, he says, I give you the way. I choose you. I have sent my only son to redeem you. To redeem you from that eternal separation from me. The phrase, my way, is simply our sinful self that stamps its foot like a two-year-old screaming, no! If you choose to follow my way, by rejecting the highway that I've given you, you will be left to fend for yourself and for your salvation. Our fallen human nature naturally desires to reject God's implementation, implantation of faith through the power of His Word. When we reject his gift of faith, we reject his grace and the salvation won for us by Jesus. And in so doing, we reject God's highway, the way of holiness, the way to the Father. 
For this highway is Christ. It is the birth, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus for the sins of the world. This is what Isaiah means when he writes, he will come to save you. How will he save you? Isaiah writes, God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God. This vengeance was total and complete as described in chapter 34, yet the reality for all of us is that the vengeance and recompense of God was meted out upon Christ on the cross. It is finished. So what is the result of this vision that Isaiah gives us today? This promise a salvation and redemption in life eternal. It's hope. Hope that you get to take with you everywhere you go. It's hope that will strengthen an awakened heart it is hope that will strengthen your weak hands. It is hope that will firm up your feeble knees. It is that simple prayer that speaks of the joy of our salvation that God alone has provided to us so that we might share it with others. It is my prayer that this vision, promise, and salvation from God would enable each and every one of us to hear, especially when we have anxious hearts. Be strong. Fear not. For your hope is sure and certain. You have a hope that is more than enough to conquer sin, death, and the devil. You have a hope that actually binds us together as the body of Christ. You have a hope from God that strengthens and preserves you in all difficulties enabling you to even respond with joy in the face of death. For our Lord and Creator has promised that He has ransomed us. And as the redeemed, we will walk on this way of holiness unto eternal life, no matter what may come our way. Thanks be to God for our hope, Jesus Christ, the way of holiness to life everlasting. Amen. Now the peace that passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.